So welcome everyone to Good for a Chat. Uh, my name is Jo Taranto and this is a place where we meet people making changes, connecting communities and find out what drives them and why they do the work they do and why they keep coming back to do more. Uh, I am the co-founder of Good for the Hood and we are a social enterprise a consultancy specialising in communications and sustainability from the most grassroots uh, projects all the way through to government strategy. Uh, we find ourselves working with people uh, and their rivers, their oceans, their lands, uh, each other, their dogs, when they decide what? to be part of it. <laughs> and uh, we are all about uh, encouraging the sort of changes that we need to live in more harmony uh, and connection with each other and, and the ecology that binds us. Uh, so it's, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Frankie, but also to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Wallamadigal. Uh, today I'm on the edge of the Eora and Darug Nations in Sydney, uh, in the community of North Ride. Uh, I can hear the beautiful kookaburras giving me their song this morning, and that's why Frankie's having a go. <laughs> um, that I would like to acknowledge um, that um, and pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders are past and present and if welcome you today if you identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. Uh, we are remiss not to acknowledge that this is the oldest uh, living culture on earth uh, and if we wish to be in more connection with each other in country uh, we really need to return to the practices um, and understandings that, uh, that Aboriginal voices bring uh, to our communities. Uh, it's also a very fundamental part of understanding regeneration, which is something we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and so it gives me a great joy to introduce Alice Howard Vines today. She is the founder of another consultancy called Humanize This. Uh, she is uh, specialises in design and innovation, and she supports, supports sustainability leaders and helps people address the really complex things that uh, often get very messy um, and require um, some expert uh, strategic and, and design um, specialty. So that's that's Alice's uh, bag. She's got uh, qualifications in sustainability, digital media. Uh, she's an, uh, one of the alumni from the Centre of Sustainability Leadership and also uh, studied at Schumacher College in the UK. And She's a pretty fab person, I think. So welcome, Alice. Hi. Hello, Joe, and hi, everybody. It's so, so nice to be here. And thank you for that warm introduction. And I'm particularly enjoying the uh, little box of enthusiasm coming from your friend, Frankie. She's silent now. She just has to get out of the system, which I, I, I can relate to. So, <laughs> right, just to have you, Alice. Voice. so where are you today? Tell us about where you were dialing in from today. Hey, so I'm on beautiful Gumbangia country up in Bellingen on the mid north coast of New South Wales and I'm always grateful that my feet are placed here in these beautiful green lush lands and yeah. You moved there recently, only last year was that right? Yeah, so I moved here in November. Um, I was one of those lockdown, lockdown city uh, evacuees. Um, I made it right to the last month of lockdown. And then, yeah, my landlord decided to sell my place uh, that I had been living in for six years in Manly in Sydney. And both my flatmates moved out in lockdown. So it was one of those kind of, okay, where am I going to feel safe? Where am I going to be? And uh, I was very strongly called here, having never been here before, um, but had a couple of Gumbangiri friends and another friend who lived here. So I have landed absolutely in the spot that I'm meant to be. And uh, I'm constantly surprised by just how many wonderful people and initiatives are, are here. Like I could not have predicted this and I couldn't have dreamed <laughs> Um, that, yeah, that I would be here and feel so connected in such a short space of time. And it's obviously great on the back of what we've been through that you can still connect with your clients and your friends and, and family all over the world. Um, you didn't grow up in Australia, is that right? 
Tell us about I didn't. You- I grew up and, yeah, it's kind of, it feels a little bit full circle. So I grew up in a, on a farm uh, in the northeast of the UK in Yorkshire, um, on a farm that's been in my family for generations, but came kind of to my father sideways from an uncle that um, died um, young with no children. And so that was such a gift for my father to, at 17, to inherit this place. He had no idea that would um, come to him. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of treatment of, as life of a, as a gift um, was in land and, and place as a gift was kind of a strong ethic of his. Um, and then, yeah, came to Australia in 2005 um, and I lived and worked on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, was really drawn there and had been, yeah, really strongly um, kind of just interested in in the reef and in whales and those kind of things as a younger child um whenever I got a like a class award or anything like that in primary school they would always give me a nature book like I was always obsessed (laughs) Um, so one year they gave me a king and queens book and I wasn't happy about it (laughs) Um, although kings and queens are great Um, and then so 2005 I came to Australia and then I've lived um, kind of all over um, along the East Coast, but um, spent most of my time um, on the Sunshine Coast and then Melbourne um, and uh, finally came to Sydney about six years ago. Um, Having not been a city person, I never expected that I would live uh, in a city. And I really feel like those six years in Sydney were a kind of rite of passage for me to come to understand place in a different way, where perhaps the things that I um, that I really valued that uh, or to see things differently. So I had this kind of, I was felt like I was always wrestling with the city. Um, you know, I, I wanted green spaces. I wanted big, expansive views. Of course, like I was very lucky in Sydney to have the ocean, but, um, but this kind of wrestling with street lights and concrete and buildings and metal and, you know, steel and just this construction was so very different to the environment um, that I'd grown up in. And for me, that rite of passage was walking North Head almost every day and seeing the seasons change and seeing, uh, particularly in lockdown, the way that place uh, just enabled people to have a sense of peace and stillness amongst all of the craziness that was going on, the way we noticed light, the way we saw plants change over those seasons. So, yeah, that's a little bit. And then coming to Bellingen, it's, uh, there's, big trees, there's fresh water, there's green, you know, green mountains everywhere. So it feels like a coming home. And I felt that really strongly uh, the second time I came here, actually. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you did move just before the big floods. What's that done to the community uh, or for your experience of the community, at least us? Yeah, well, I feel in Bellingen, and for me personally, it was a different experience, I think, to community because Bellingen is a place that is used to flooding in as such. We were very fortunate uh, for the most part that we didn't experience the same levels of uh, flooding and particularly inundation and all of that. We've, we were just on the edge of it. Um, And so the trauma that people have experienced further north and a lot of friends of mine did lose their their homes um, and have been severely impacted. We didn't have that to the same effect down here, although having never been through that before and just being situated in that amount of rain was really intense because I didn't know what was going to happen. We were cut off for three days. I live on the north side of Bellingen and the river, you know, this main um, river um, flooded very, you know, it was a major, major flood and some houses did get inundated in Bellingen, but for the most part, uh, it was a, a relatively low impact for a major flood. A lot of roads and infrastructure have been affected, um, but not on the same scale as further north. So personally, it was pretty terrifying. I was working um, at that point on regenerating Australia um, 
and the launch of that was just coming out. And so to be trying to do this kind of uh, high impact it felt like quite high stress project at that point just trying to get to that launch in the middle of the floods and I know Damon Gamo was was pretty impacted um you know personally um and his family by that you know was quite a strange and worrying situation so it was definitely uncomfortable but physically structurally everything here is in, in my part of town was okay and we'll talk a little bit more about Regenerating Australia in a sec, because I know you've been really involved in um, sort of the launch of that amazing film and, um, you know, and, and seeing firsthand some of the communities embrace those stories. But um, can you first tell us a little bit about being a designer? Because I don't know if you always knew what design was and that it was an option, but it's something I've come to very late in my life. And I always feel a little bit like, I wish I had known that this was a thing before. So um, can you tell us a little bit about design, whether it's being a designer or, or the, what the process is for design? Because I think a lot of us um, maybe don't realise that we actually use elements of, of design thinking or, um, you know, approaches to design. But really, it is quite I think quite a remarkable skill set, and um, you know, how did you how did you find yourself in in this place of of, of designing uh, solutions or strategies or or um, ideas? Mm, it's a good question. So I'll try and answer it as succinctly as possible. Um, but there's a lot in there. So first of all, I was that kid at school who was really like. I would care about what I was writing, but I would have like four different colored pens and I would underline things and I always had to write in black and it had to be white paper, not this, you know, and I didn't want the ink to like bleed into the paper. <laughs> it sounds silly, but I, I, and you know, I'm mind about what cup I drink out of. And, you know, I like the design of something to, it, it, I'm sensory like that. So, um, I didn't have the language, obviously, for that. I didn't really know what that was, but I knew that I cared about books. I cared about page layout, about the way things were presented. And I knew I was a little bit fussy um, in terms of um, the things that I like to touch or see or have around me, um, which is really interesting because I think that's like, you know, that's a clue towards, oh, what is it, you know, that, that um, irks you. Um, design the way that I see it is, um, is intentionally creating the future. It's putting something, when you're actually designing something, you're thinking about what might be. But not just that, you're also in, in user experience design, which is my um, practice, you're thinking about the context in which that thing is used, whether it's if you're designing um, a graphic design and it's a logo, for instance, you know, you're thinking about all the different elements that go into that. Um, there's four orders of design, and I'm not going to go into a whole theory of it, but, but um, first order of design might be something like a cup, something tangible, something that is an artisan might have made in the old days. And then the kind of second order, we've got things that are less tangible. So it might be a logo, um, you know, or a design of something that you can't really touch and feel. And the third order might be experience and how you move between different, across different things. So Apple was one of the first um, organizations to think about the unwrapping of their computer, not just the design of the computer itself, but how it was purchased, how it arrived, how it unboxed. Um, so that's taking both the tangible and intangible elements. And then you've got things that become increasingly less tangible, like service design and strategic design and now systemic design, where A does not equal B. You don't necessarily have pottery or ceramic and come out with a cup. You might have behaviours and lots of different intangible things where you become more experimental about the way that you apply design. Um, so that's a little bit about that. How I got into it, I did a publishing and English degree. I was always about form and content. So not just when I did an English degree, people would say, oh, you know, that's not 
uh, vocational was the word back then. You know, how will you use it? Will you become a lawyer, blah, 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 and, or a journalist? Um, and I, again, just wanted to make sure that I had that tangible aspect to it. So I did um, book publishing and learned about the publishing industry. Um, and at that time, in between 97 and 2000, um, that was when um, publishing was going electronic. So the, you know, CD-ROMs um, were seen as the, the next thing. So how we design ele in electronic spaces. And then I did my master's degree in electronic media, which was much more about that those online spaces. And so for me, I'm fascinated by how people think act and see the world around them and how they interact with the things, the people, the places uh, that they inhabit, and then how those behaviors then shape in turn the way the world around us. Um, so yeah, that's the long and short answer to design. And you, you once said to me that good design is invisible. Can you explain what that means? I hope I haven't misappropriated the mm. quote. But yeah. 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 Say again? You, yeah, you, you told me this once when we were talking about something and I went, ooh, I'm writing that down. It's, um, yeah, <laughs> it, it helped a lot at the time. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, so, so I do think good design is invisible. It's when something is fit for purpose, when it becomes so intuitive that you don't even notice, notice it. So the way you might move between different spaces online, um, that there's been very intentional design about that. It, good design, as I say, is, is intuitive. It's really fit for purpose and it's, taken into account the context of use. So human behavior, if we start thinking about how people act and, and in the world around them, is not just a product of them and all the things that kind of make, make us us. Uh, it's also the context. So how we uh, act in different spaces is different the way that I might drink a cup of tea with you versus drinking a cup of tea with somebody else, the act of making that cup of tea. And I don't know, I'm using that as an example, but um, it's deeply contextual. So uh, you cannot take a person and their behavior out of the environment. And so for what that means when good design is invisible is that it's thought, it's thoughtful. It's, uh, it's thought about how um, something is going to be used and it's designed appropriately for that. It can also be surprising. I love it when it's design is visible and suddenly, you know, it, it surprises you and, and it thrills you and, and delights you. And, you know, I think street art is such a lovely example of that, you know, when you see things in places that you don't expect. Um, but yeah. And so what sort of things would you help a client with in your work then, Alice? Do they come to you with a problem and want you to solve it? Do they come to you with a, an outcome they wish to get to? Or do sometimes they just come and go, I don't even know what we need, but we think we need you? <laughs> Great. So all of the above. I love it best when they come with the last one because that gives us such a lovely window uh, of exploration to do together. I think whenever you are engaging in a project, be a group process or a new service that you're designing or something along those lines, and you think you know the answer already, I would suggest that you might want to check yourself. Um, only because with human-centered design, which has a bad rap um, because it's placing humans at the middle of uh, the design process, um, perhaps the argument is to the exclusion of, of environment. And I just want to say that that's had its, its um, it's been really important in the design of government services and things like that, where there haven't been care embedded into uh, those processes. It's been really important to center the human. Um, but when people come with the, with the human design uh, center process um, or methodology, you're looking at designing the right thing before you design the thing right. And often people will come with a solution and they just, they just want you to polish it. They just want you to refine it and make it 
you know, attractive to whoever they're trying to get to use it. But actually, you'll find that something that, uh, that, that often they haven't really understood the deeper challenge, the deeper kind of motivation be be behind why somebody might want to use a particular service or product or whatever that is. Increasingly, um, I'm working with community and uh, kind of community processes. I'm going to call them social processes. And so the way that I use design now is very much about how do we design spaces and places where people can come together to think in different ways. So that is now I've kind of moved through service design, although I still do a bit of that and I coach in, in that. Um, but increasingly I'll, I'll design workshops, processes, longer kind of strategy pieces that help groups form and stay together through difficult challenges to do a thing. And at the end of that thing, what's often, when I, I call it a thing because it's undefined, it's very designery, sorry about that. Um, but, because uh, you don't know what you're gonna get at the end of it, but always in every process, in every project that I've done, what we come away with is relationship. And that to me is the absolute measure of success. How strong are your relationships at the end of doing something together, an emergent process? So that is, it sounds quite meta, but designing emergent processes, designing group processes that help people come to a solution together and do that in concert with each other while maintaining good relationships for the next thing that you might do together. That is, <laughs> that's the magic. It's right. Yeah, I think the first time I met designers and started talking about this, I realized how nebulous sometimes it all felt. And I know that that probably is part of your challenge is letting people be okay with that that actually you won't have all the answers and if you do have the answers then maybe you are wrong um so i love that you've talked about that can you talk about um this shift i guess it's a shift for you but it's also a shift often for organizations and communities and we're seeing a lot more talk about it um this human-centered design which you know like you've said has its place but also has its um its critics to this sense of regenerative design and, and what regenerative design really is, um, maybe in contrast or, or in complement to human-centered design. Absolutely. So this again is a is a big question. So um, they are all part of a, a portfolio, I guess, of um, design praxis that um, that brings people together to think about things in new ways. So with human-centered design, as I say, it's, and, and with all of it, it's about curiosity. I mean, I think curiosity and care, regardless of um, what you're doing, uh, uh, need to be baked into uh, the, both the process and the, and the outcome. So, the, and that's, I guess the the most the difference between human centered design and regenerative design is like what's the outcome what's the scale of the impact of that outcome and how transformative is it so my work has been in a backdrop of digital transformation to start with and now sustainability transformation and now there's this whole this move uh, in toward regenerative design. Regenerative design has come at, kind of at, from two places. So the built environment um, and came through uh, Bill Reed and, and others with the Regenesis Institute and Pamela Mang um, and, and plenty of others. So I don't wanna, <laughs> um, that's, that is uh, kind of through the built environment and place. And then there's also um, regeneration in, in terms of the hands and soil regenerative farming and, and agriculture and that kind of thing. So when we're talking about regenerative design, I think it's really important to say where, like where are where, where is our focus? Because it's quite an again a nebulous thing. And the majority of people think about the built environment. And that's really important because the built environment affects every single aspect of sustainability or um, and sustainability and regeneration are also not the same thing. 
So uh, I've got a really great graphic that um, I will share with you that came through Daniel Christian Wall um, and Bill Reed, which is this kind of axis of sustainability is doing, you know, less harm or it might be neutral. Regeneration is actually about working with um, with the life sustaining uh, properties is about observing what natural system, how natural systems think and act. So not just human systems, which human centered design is looking at. Regenerative design is looking literally at the physical environment and taking uh, patterns and, um, and learnings from that and embedding it into the design of things that are likely to not just affect humans, but will affect uh, the, the whole environment. So when we talk about regenerative economics or regenerative environment, we need to be quite specific about, uh, I think, about about what we're talking about when we talk about regeneration, but in all of it, again, care. <laughs> um, how do we move towards something that heals and nurtures life, heals damage that we've done, nurtures and enables life and life's processes to come through? That is what we're talking about with regenerative design. I mean, the word generative, how do we be more and more generous in, in the work that we do and extend that for future generations um, and the environment itself. So we're not just talking about the here and now and the near future, which is what human-centered design is tends to be more focused on. It's interesting. I know um, I feel for a lot of organizations, we are starting to recognize this difference between just keeping things, the status quo, that this sustainability, let's just keep being able to do the same things over and over with this sense that there's still a depletion, there's still a, a road to, you know, degeneration really by nature of not giving our planet a chance to really catch up or, or, or regroup. Um, and I think um, I'm seeing it a lot with a talk about the circular economy. And I know that that's been um, quite central to uh, a lot of uh, policy, a lot of approaches. Um, but you've sort of stepped into another space, which is this understanding of the donut economics. And, and people may or may not have heard about that. Um, and it's almost a little, I guess, a step further into, or an adjunct to the circular economy, which is, you know, that we, we don't create waste, that we create a space for, for things to um, align with natural processes. Therefore, it is by nature regenerative. But tell us a bit about this concept of donut economics and, how this sort of forms um, a space for regeneration. Yeah, okay. So firstly, um, the point that I wanna pick up on in there is again, just to reiterate um, in case it didn't come through that also regenerative design is, is place-based, it's place specific. So as I was talking before about context in the context of human-centered design and our behavior in regenerative design, place is everything. Where I love uh, Auntie Mary Graham says, I'm located, therefore I am not, uh, which is a kind of indigenous view of, I think, therefore I am. Um, I really love that. So um, donor economics uh, was, uh, is a, it's a fun model. I'm going to put up a picture of a donut again so that you can just, just next to me um, <laughs> on my little, little um, icon up there. So um, it's a model of economics, which is uh, both profound and playful, which are two of my favorite qualities to bring together. Um, so it looks at, she's taken, Kate Rayworth is an economist, UK um, based, but has worked um, all over the world with Oxfam um, and I think the UN as well. So she um, pulled together the planetary boundaries took these from places like the Stockholm um, Resilience Center um, and Rockstrom and various other places. So put together these nine planetary boundaries. These are the biophysical boundaries of which and thresholds like CO2, um, waterway pollution, uh, ocean acidification, uh, all of these things, soil health that 
they have boundaries. They have been looked at scientifically. If we exceed that, what will happen? So that uh, basically creates, it, it un, starts to begin to unravel the fabric of life, basically. It's like, that's the outer ring. The inner ring of the donut, um, it has 12 uh, areas that are called the social foundations. So they are based on the sustainable development goals and they're things like for, uh, water, food, housing, education, Sorry, I think I said water. I meant to say food, uh, health, housing, education, income and work. There are, no, there are 12 of those. And so she came up with this at a, at a kind of global scale to look at, okay, what, and, and then the safe space, sorry, the middle bit of the donut, the bit that you would eat, um, um, has, uh, is the safe and just space for humanity, or as Dr. Michelle Maloney says, the sp safe space for all life, because it's not just about humans in this, it's, we are part intimately part of life and we can be both part of its um, destruction or part of its generation we can and and that's that's a, ch a choice and also the way that our systems and structures are designed so there you've got the outer ring the social foundations which create a thrivable future and thrivable environment for people to live in uh, and you've got the, this safe space. So really what we've done and what's happening across the world is that people are taking this model, cities, localities are taking this model and experimenting with it about what does this look like at a local scale? The, um, you know, the, the model itself was created in about 2014, but it's so big. How do we bring it down and do it in place? What would this look like if we used the donut as a compass for life in the 21st century. And so to do that requires an, uh, an understanding of who are we now? How are we living? How is that creating or destroying or um, life around us? And who are we becoming? Who do we want to be as a, as a place, as a, as a locality? And there are lots of qualitative and quantitative ways to do that. So in Sydney, for example, um, we are looking at Greater Sydney, the scale of Greater Sydney. How much food are we bringing in? How much, how, um, how what's the impact of our city on the, uh, not just the environment of the city itself, but on the environment around us? How can we be as generous as the wildland next door, which is a question um, that, I, that is a beautiful one. Um, and also how can we make sure that the way we're living isn't impacting um, and, and reducing other people's uh, impact to live around the world. Um, and so you get these four lenses, there's the local social, local ecological, global social and global ecological. So you're looking both both the, the here and now of what's of our um, of our locality. Um, and then you're looking also at the impact that our way of life is having on other people and ecosystems around the world. I think um, what's been really interesting about the work that you and, and um, sort of a core and growing crew are working on with this group called Regen Sydney else is, is the diversity of, um, I guess, a, a, occupations, interests and um, specialties. Like you've brought together this group of people who are not all your traditional sustainability minds. Um, they're people from all walks of life. Can you tell us a little bit about this group and, and what is Regen Sydney really trying to do? Is it is it about um, harnessing this donut economy, uh, economic model? Is it, what, what do you wanna see happen? Great. Good question. So currently we have uh, Regen Sydney is a growing network and movement for a regenerative um, future for Greater Sydney and, and using the economy as a vehicle to do that, because whether we realise it or not, the economy, uh, we touch it and it touches us every single day. So we've got about 300 people uh, involved um, with that movement at the minute and, and growing. And really what we're looking at, we just put out um, a little report that uh, 
gives you a, a bit more of um, the context. I haven't got it in front of me, but um, so the first thing is to, um, to move, transition to an economy that heals and nurtures rather than destroys. And to show that that movement is not only uh, kind of aspirational, but it's already happening across Greater Sydney. I think part of it is that we don't see the good work that is happening. Uh, all too often, it's kind of invisible. And yet, there are brilliant people working in regenerative design, working in permaculture, working in soil health, working in connection to country and local ecology and traditional indigenous ways of knowing and seeing. Um, so there's all this incredible work. That is one, so, so to move uh, to an economy that heals and, and nurtures rather than destroys, to, um, to grow a community um, of people and bring them together to make that work visible is, is really important. And to get the donut, uh, to get Sydney inside the donut within a generation. So like in order to do that, we need to know like, again, what is the state of play of how we are now? And to what extent are we exceeding our ecological carrying capacity? What extent are we undermining people's ability to care for themselves and their communities and their local ecosystems? And it's uh, it's a massive piece of work, I suppose. Uh, it started in lockdown. Um, yeah, it was kind of one of those lockdown things of like, okay, this is a prescient moment for, um, for creating change. How might we do this? And that exploration has kind of brought us uh, to, um, to now uh, in September, October time, we're going to be doing some community workshops for what do communities want? Like, what is our vision for ourselves? What does a healthy, connected, empowered, enabled Sydney look like from your vantage point? And in order to do that, we need so many people. We need so many different perspectives. We don't just want to, I keep thinking of that um, picture of the elephant or, you know, and there's, there's a few men around it and there's one person It's like, what do you see? And it's like, oh, gray, you know, an eye, but you don't know what, what it is until you get all those different perspectives. Sorry, it was a bad analogy. I just wanted to get an elephant into this conversation. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think what we need is um, those uh, are those different perspectives and the way that we're going about it um, is a kind of two scales. And this is where Good for the Hood, your, your kind of group of, of people uh, at working at the community level who are community catalysts, it would be brilliant to think about all those little local donut bakeries, I'm going to call them, um, uh, good work that's already happening in your community. Can we plug that in? And, and at the same time, can we also create this kind of quick and dirty donut, I'm going to call it, which is like, um, you know, we get lots of which Melbourne have done a really good job of this, by the way, um, they're, and we're using their um, example. Um, but they've, you know, they had four or five workshops last year with about 100 community members to create their own donut, the Melbourne donut. And the work that they've done is, is excellent. They've adapted it that to be Melbourne specific. Um, they've put in a, a piece there that brings together the inner and the outer rings, which is about healing and caring for country. They realized that arts and culture was missing in the center ring, and that's so important to the DNA of Melbourne. Um, and so they've created that, thank you for putting that in the chat, yeah, their own version of that donor. And we wanna do something similar to show the aspiration. But how great would it be if we take, for example, uh, the, the financial news that comes at the end of uh, the news segment that kind of says this, today the stock market has gained this many points and lost this many points. Um, but imagine if we had uh, on our local news a picture of the donut and showed where we were exceeding, um, you know, our biospherical limits and where are we underperforming in terms of, you know, where how many people don't have a bed this evening, how many people don't have a home, how many people are food impoverished. This 
these things are statistics that have people behind them and we need to be able to see that to understand who we are now and who we're becoming and whether we're on that right trajectory and the economy is the way that that can happen to make that visible because the economy is so much more than just about finance about um you know money it's about goodwill it's about relationship and i love this quote that says from peter senge that says um Transforming systems is ultimately about transforming relationships between the people who shape the systems. So when we think about Regent Sydney, we think about regenerative economy, how do we rewire our relationships with each other as well as our relationships to all the things that give us life, of which finance is uh, an important one, but only one. Mm. Yeah, it's powerful stuff. And I think um, you've sort of touched on obviously what we're very passionate about at Good for the Hood, that constant push between the local and really the global. I mean, um, which is why I think um, the work you did with Damon's movie, uh, Regenerating Australia, and I'll, I'll put the link if anyone hasn't tapped into that movement of regenerators, you know, they've been calling themselves regenerators for a while. Um, it is about local stories, but it's with a view that there's a global solution. Um, was there any takeaways for you from being involved in that process? You know, you were sort of seeing these stories and see, hearing these conversations. Is this something that needs to just happen at the most micro and macro levels everywhere? Yeah, well, that's how change happens, really. Uh, we don't know it's <laughs> it's there until it's done, you know, and often we can't see those signals around us, which is why making visible what's already happening is so important, but not just that, to be able to find each other through that work. I think the work, my involvement with Regenerating Australia was not on the film side, but my, um, my colleague Claire Marshall and I, Claire is a futurist at UTS, um, she um, she and I were charged with or, um, developing a community workshop that supports the rollout of some of the ideas in this film. So the film itself is only 17 minutes long also, and it's packed full of ideas of what Australia could look like by 2030 um, if we listen to the needs of our people. Uh, and so there's lots of ideas in there and not all of them will be directly applicable to your place, but to watch that film and then have a landing spot to come together as a community. So you might do a community screening and then have a workshop afterwards that helps you work through some of those ideas, ideate what do you want your town or place to look like by 2030, what's got you there, who's helped, who's been involved, whose voices might you not have thought about, um, because whose voices aren't in the room is every bit as important as whose voice is in the room, and we must always, always remember that. Um, and yeah, so my, I guess it's maybe a little early to know exactly what the, the outcome of those workshops are. Um, so I was working with WWF, um, uh, and Regen Studios on, on that. And um, yeah, we're just looking forward to seeing, seeing that roll out. The community workshops, I think, have only been um, available for maybe the last um, month or so. Um, they've been in pilot, um, in pilot form. So yeah, just excited to see um, how they, what ideas come out from communities. And that idea of scale of actually doing something on a smaller scale and that having uh, ripple effects is again if we're thinking about regeneration it's not taking from somewhere else it's creating additional capacity um, and support for other places and so that idea of scale is if we're actually working in that way that and we're connected to place um, on a nested systems is, uh, you know, how, how we are in our household, how we are in our neighborhood, how we are in our region, our state, our country, they all affect each other. And that's not to say that we don't need that structural change of legislation, of policy, and all those things, which is a level that 
Regen Sydney is absolutely working at as well, both that scale and the community on the ground scale, and that's where it's challenging. Um, but we need all of it. So I love, you know, that idea of start where you are, do what you can and use what you have. Like, just start there and um, and focus on relationship. That's the most important thing. Without that, you have nothing. And you've got to be able to rumble with people. You've got to be able to, you know, breathe through the discomfort, laugh through the discomfort, um, because none of this is a straightforward process. Beautiful words there, Alison. I don't think we could frame it any any better for, um, to finish. Um, uh, I just have one question. Um, how do you see government local bodies um, helping this work immediately? And what is the main aspect you would change if you were given unfettered decision to help the elephants? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, I might have to ask you to repeat the second question because I'm going to go into like... Ask, what would you change if, you, if it was up to you to, to um, I guess, help governments and, and maybe the big decision makers? What, what would you do to make sure that, you know, that things were a little more regenerative? Is oh. there something that you think we, we could just apply? Is it, is it a context or a framework that, that we need to be a bit more holistic maybe <laughs> so there's a couple of things and they again gonna sound the other day I did a podcast and I was called practically profound uh, which I kind of <laughs> I kind of like so so I'm gonna give some they're probably gonna sound quite intangible but one of them is thinking on that system scale and often we don't we think on kind of uh, one particular scale and we lose vision for the other scales so one is like adopt a systems mindset a systems perspective and if you don't know what that is go outside sit and observe how things interact with each other outdoors um, the second is listening like deep listening and it sounds so simple but it's not the reason that I've been in work this whole my whole career is because companies or organizations governments forgot how to listen to the needs of people or place and instead we're designing and creating all these things in silos and we're not understanding the relationships between both our how we're um how we're working in the world and how that impacts other things and so having that uh, it's again a mindset shift from you know outcome you know process to outcome to actually adopting a more curious and experimental approach because as we there's a whole body of work around this but as we enter um, more volatile complex and uncertain times which we are in right now but as we continue to go through them the things that are going to hold us in that is relationship the things that are going to hold us in that is the knowledge that nothing is certain and so how do we adapt and build our own adaptive capacity to shift and alter course as we go so and that includes policy so on a really practical level to what that means to me and i love what jeff scully's been doing um with city of sydney is that public policy development how do you, you bring together citizens juries to make decisions on the things that affect them decisions are not made behind doors they're made on the grounds where people live and they are made by the people who are impacted and representative of those communities so that is one thing that i would really love to see amazing alice um i feel like we could listen to you all day and i feel like um everyone needs to go and check out um the work that Alice does on her page, Humanize This, her, if you want to work with Alice, which you most certainly should, um, she can help you uh, navigate the, the nebulous and the uncertain. Um, you can absolutely get involved in Regen Sydney. What a powerful community of people from, I, I can't even list, if I feel like I will be shortchanging anyone if I list, but I know there are designers, futurists, lawyers, professors of almost every type of, um, major institution, we've got, um, you know, community members, we've got policymakers, 
Um, we've got people who are interested in health, welfare, justice, Indigenous cultural learning. Oh, yeah, I want to. I want to just. I want to give a big shout out to Uncle Phil Bly, who's a dark and young elder, um, for guiding us, and David Beaumont from City of Sydney for guiding Regen Sydney. And a question that Uncle Phil, that we walk with every day, that came from Uncle Phil, which is, how do we live in this land with joy? And whenever, like, you know, you're overwhelmed by dark times and by all the weight of the world, um, that question of how do we live in this land with joy? What if our purpose to be here was to find joy in the land that we live and to express that in whatever way is, you know, available to us? So, so definitely go and find your joy in Regen Sydney. If you're not in Sydney, but you're, you know, you, maybe you're closer to Melbourne, check out Regen Melbourne. Um, but again, you, I don't think you have to be necessarily in the community to be of the community and to also, you know, maybe offer an insight that that was missing as well. So um, you also can check out Regenerating Australia. Um, I've included the link there. Um, but Alice, thank you so much uh, for your insights, for your wisdom, for um, your joy and for being with us today. It, it's really beautiful and um, I feel uh, I feel somewhat uh, like I've just had a therapy session but also feel also like I've just um, been given a, a kick up the bum too. So it's, it's a nice little just, you know, therapeutic, enthusiastic motivation. So, <laughs> so thank you. Um, thank you for your thoughtful questions too. That was, right. yeah, it was a really lovely session. And um, thanks for, for joining us. And um, this recording will be online if you'd like to share it with someone else. Uh, it'll be on um, our Goodhood community if you're not already watching it there. Uh, thank you for your time today and um, look after yourselves and each other. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you.